Let me take your attention then to the passage which we read together. As I said, I've always tried to have a text for the year, and God willing, it will be hanging in front of you again in the next week or so. This verse has been on my mind for quite some time. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In the ESV it says, just reading that part of the verse, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. In the NIV it says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The one thing they all agree on is the place of prayer and its present power in and for the church. I've titled my sermon this morning, Your Will Be Done. Hopefully you recognize that from Matthew chapter 6. If you pray the Lord's Prayer, and I hope you do, that you're actually asking God to take control. Now that's a tough one, especially in a very independent age. We're all encouraged, aren't we? To be independent is part of growing up, but independence, when it goes too far, can cause chaos and anarchy. You see that in many of the wars in the world. Somebody somewhere thinks that they're right and everybody else should do and think as they think. And so in places like China, slowly but surely, the right to be different is being eroded and taken away. Your will be done. Is that your prayer? It's interesting, and I hadn't really noticed it until studying this, that almost every New Testament letter finishes with the subject of prayer. There are exceptions. Some of them express a prayer, others encourage us to pray. Now you're saying, oh no, he's not going to preach on prayer again. I put it to you, it's what's in the text. And if I hadn't preached it this week, I would have been preaching it next week. And one of the disciplines of looking at God's word is recognizing that it's God who sets our priorities. That's what it means to say, you will be done. That's what it means. It's not that he just had run out of something to say and sort of squeezed it in to make sure the letter was of a certain length. There's something about prayer, and I'll hopefully be able to show you something of that from this passage. There's something about prayer that is not just important, but it's unique and vital to Christian living. Your will be done. The first section allows me to talk about prayer itself. And then the third section where it talks about Elijah reminds us that God is not a slot machine. You don't pray today and necessarily get today what you're praying about. That dear man had to wait three and a half years to see prayer finally answered. Prayer requires patience because our prayer is really to say, your will be done. And that means fit in with God's purpose and God's timetable. Prayer. It is to be our way of life. Verses 13 through 15 are quite clear. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. We could spend a long time going through every detail here, but what I want to do is to, to grab the picture. This concept where prayer is about everything. R.C. Sproul says on this passage in James, we've had a book where a lot has been said about the use of the tongue or the misuse of the tongue. 
And now what you get is the proper use of your tongue. Prayer and praise as they go together. Because in this passage is this lovely picture of a life lived in the presence of God. But before I get to that, let me just attempt to clear up what is often a misunderstanding. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Some people have misused this verse. And they've claimed then that if you pray for somebody who's ill or unwell or whatever, then they will be healed. That's not what he's talking about here. Because in the Bible, sickness is never simply the external condition of our bodies. Sickness is the effect of sin. I need to be careful how I say it. But ultimately, if men had never sinned, there would be no sickness. And if you reverse the argument then, all sickness, the fact that there is such a thing as sickness, is part of the curse that was laid upon Adam and Eve and humanity. And so when the Bible uses that word sick and changes it to sin at times, you have to understand that the symptoms that are seen in sickness are a picture of the real trouble in every individual, their sinfulness. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You can find whole books based on that verse. Is there healing in the atonement? Would be a typical kind of title. And the answer is yes, but the healing the atonement addresses is not physical ailment. It is, in fact, our sinful nature. It's there that the penalty for sin was paid, and through that, we are saved. You remember when Joseph was told the name of the baby that was to come. He was to be called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. That's the real problem for humanity. We are rebels against God. We are independently minded to the effect that we push God aside or simply use him like the ambulance or fire brigade and call on him in emergencies. Whereas if I've understood this part of James, It's an exhortation to have prayer as an everyday vital part of life. It's not how long you pray. It's why you pray and who you're praying to. And so when it says here, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Notice he goes back to sin and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. There is healing for the child of God. Notice again, going backward through the verses, anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church. That's that's an important uh, um, step here. Let him call for the elders of the church and they're going to anoint and pray over. If you read your New Testament, you could go to the book of Corinthians and you'll find there talk about the gift of healing. And that that is sovereignly dispersed by God among the congregation. But you need to have in your mind the historical nature of the the Bible. It's not a, a flat document. It was not all revealed just at one moment in time. It was revealed in history. And you can find a progress in the Bible. So that when the church was young, there were many miraculous phenomena which were very important to establish its testimony. But as it grows, you'll notice here it says that when somebody's sick, you don't go and find the person with the gift of healing. What you do is you call for the elders, the leaders of the church, and they come and pray over you. And they then lay hands, they put oil on you. The the oil has significance in that in the Middle East it would have a healing effect, like an ointment. But also it's a picture of the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament. And so the the, the church is taught here to, to pray for those who are indeed sick. 
And if you take time to read your Bible, you'll find that even amongst the apostles, there was not immediate healing for everybody. Just a quick list. In Galatians 4, verses 13 to 15, the apostle Paul was ill. He had an eye, some kind of eye infection. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, you find that Paul has a thorn in the flesh, which God doesn't remove. Philippians 2, 25, Epaphroditus was ill. 1 Timothy 5, 23, Timothy was ill. 2 Timothy 4, 20, Trophimus was ill. Now that would seem to indicate to us that there was no immediate gift of miraculous healing that could be applied just by getting the right person into the room. Rather, the, the call here is to understand that our God and Saviour is sovereign over our lives and that he uses sickness to remind us that we are sinners because that's the ultimate root of every sickness. Now, I do need to be careful. I don't want to oversimplify so that you then go and say, is that this? It's a principle which needs to be held on to, especially in our prayer life. And so we do pray for those who are sick. We pray for their healing. But in doing so, we recognize the sovereignty of God and whether they are healed or otherwise. It's a way of life. And so James began the section, I've gone backwards through it, with a, a broad exhortation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now, if you remember the whole book of James, there's a great deal of suffering in here. And there is even the insight that suffering can be allowed by God. Chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Don't think because things are not going right that that's an utter disaster. Count it all joy so that when you get into the corner, uh, then you need to learn to look up. You need to look up and trust in God. And again, chapter 4 and verse 13 and the few verses that follow, it says, Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas... You do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. By implication, you see, death is waiting for all of us. And there's a sense in which there is no present Solution to death. There is, I hesitate because that is coming, isn't it? When the Lord returns, death will be no more. But the fact is that in this world, people do find themselves beset by trouble. And one reason that the Lord allows trouble into your life is to get you on your knees. It's to get you looking up. Old Archer McMillan gave me those words when I was just a very young Christian. God puts you on your back to make you look up. Sometimes that's all you can do. But it is a very helpful way to see life if you're going to understand it as a biblical Christian life. And then it says quite positively as, a, as an address to balance it, is anyone cheerful? We all like to be cheerful, don't we? Nobody likes to be sick or in trouble. Is anyone cheerful? What do you do when you're cheerful? Do you stop praying? Let him get the words right. Sings psalms. The word is literally psalms in the Greek. But you know from your New Testament that they sang more than the writings of David. They sang psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, and so what he's saying here is, even when you're well, it should be part of your life's existence to be praising God, which is a form of prayer, which is a recognition that you're living in his world and you're living under his tutelage and his care. You and I always imagine that good times are all we need, but in actual fact, if you look at our present generation, who are being swamped with good times. 
We have more entertainment and pleasure than any generation that's ever passed. And you don't have to go anywhere to get it. It's at the press of a button in your house. The danger that has now happened is people have forgotten all about God. So let's be sure that when we're enjoying things, we take time to say thank you to God for it. That when you're having the privilege and the benefits of God's grace, that you do indeed recognize its source and give the glory to God. There is a hymn, isn't there? Prayer is the Christian's vital breath. The Christian's native air. Those are two interesting words. I think it's James Montgomery who wrote it. They are the, the, the prayer is the single clearest indication that you are a believer. Let it sink in, you see. How did you become a Christian? Somewhere you prayed that God would save you. Somewhere you finally gave in and said, I'm yours. Take my life and let it be. But it cannot stop there. Living in a broken world and broken bodies with broken people, you are always going to be struck by difficulty of some kind or another. It's naive to think that you can live on a holiday island for the whole of your life. Nice to get away. It's nice to have a break. It's nice to, and you can add to the list, you'll have your own preferences. But you must come back to reality. You must come back and live in the real world. And so as a believer, you see, these words which are before us are a reminder that living in the real world means recognizing the real source of everything. The real source of everything. And making prayer the evidence that you are a man or woman of faith. And let me then just apply it to the unbeliever, you see. One of the charges against unbelievers on the judgment day will be that God supplied all these good things around you and even gave you some challenges through ill health and you ignored them. And you ignored them. That is an insult to God which needs to be resolved and it can be resolved right here, right now. How is it resolved? Just close your eyes and pray. Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. Please save me. And the Bible promises that that's answered. D.L. Moody writes, there's a physician here today for every sinner. I don't care what your sin may be or how long you've been living in sin. I don't care if your life has been as black as hell. The great physician is here. Then he goes on. Now the great trouble is the great trouble is to make people believe they are sick. But once you do, they immediately flee to the great physician for help. Have you been convinced that you're sick and that the world as it is is a, a, a sick, cursed world? Thank God when you have reason to, but look to God when trouble comes. What I want to get to then is the second part of verse 16. I will deal with this first part as well. But the second part is what I want to underline. What is prayer like? Prayer is passionate. Now I know we're all British here and it's all part of our British outlook to be, to be non-dramatic and to be quiet. But you, you cannot read this verse without being challenged by the nature of prayer. Prayer is passionate. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Fervent prayer. And even as I read it, I thought to myself, that's, that's fascinating. How, how, how and where do I find the fuel to set my prayer on fire? Some people might be pressurized by other people that when you pray, you need to really say this, that, and the next thing. That's not what's going on here. Fervent prayer is the direct evidence that you've understood God's promises. Fervent prayer, effective fervent prayer that avails much, 
is you going to God with what he has promised and pleading with him for it to happen. Remember the title of the sermon, Your Will Be Done? Where do we find what God's will is in God's word? How does God express his will? What am I looking for when I say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? I'm asking God to bring to pass right here and now the very things which he has said and which he has promised. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I've wrestled with this for days now. Even this morning, going back to my books and looking up its meaning and understanding. Because the more I read it, the more I understand that th this is absolutely essential for us as Christians in the present time. Not only am I to take time to pray, but I'm to pray with a seriousness. I'm to pray with an utter dependence on the living God, to answer. Verse 16 begins, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? It has been misused so that you go to some church meetings and where everybody's telling you all the terrible things they've thought, done or not done. I think that's too far. What he's asking here. What he's exhorting us here to do is to, to be in that position where we don't come to pray pretending that we're all right. That we come to prayer with that attitude of mind that every one of us is a sinner. I read just yesterday that apparently when John Wesley began the Methodists, they were called Methodists because they had a method. And when they met in their class meetings, the first step in the method was to confess themselves to be sinners. Now that's not a very comfortable thing. You stop somebody in the street and ask them if they're a sinner and look out for the reaction. But if you stop and ask a Christian, are you a sinner? The answer should always be yes. A saved sinner. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God that he died on that cross to pay the penalty for our sin. But here's the, the awful news that even as a safe sinner, I still sin. And that's an attitude of mind, isn't it? You're never better than anybody then. In fact, you're probably among people who are better than you. Can you see how that is a, a whole worldview transformation? Which then becomes the foundation for serious, earnest prayer. As I read this, I thought to myself, when it says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, there is only one righteous man, and that's my Lord Jesus. I alluded it, to it last week that since he's ascended to heaven, his primary work is praying for you and me, and his prayer is always answered. And so in that sense, his prayer always comes to the conclusion of God's will being done in our lives. But here, surely, what James is talking about is a believer, somebody who has been justified by faith, somebody who has been taken out of the trough of sin, and they're always ready to remind them that that's where they came from, and left to themselves, that's where they would descend to, Somebody who's been taken out of the trough of sin through believing in Jesus Christ and they have now received his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 should be underlined in everybody's Bible. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's my confidence. I don't go to God and say, look, I've been a good boy today. I'm afraid I always have to go and say, forgive me for my sin. In fact, that's in the Lord's Prayer too, isn't it? Forgive us our trespasses as Jesus taught us. It's essential to our prayer. But we do come as those who have our hope in Christ. That he 
deliberately chose to take our place. That he has then brought us into a new and living relationship with God. And so that when we come to God in prayer, we find that God is for us. That even when we can't pray properly in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit takes what we are trying to say and presents it to God. So prayer is our way of expressing who God has made us. And surely the great challenge in this passage, or one of them is, the busyness of our modern lives. Was it Bill Hybels who, who wrote the book, Too Busy Not to Pray? It's a lovely title, one to get in your head. Prayer is not something you have to do. Rather, it's something you can't do without. Prayer is the infant cry of a child of God. And it always gets his ear. And because it is of this nature then, it will be fervent and effective. Interestingly, when you study the Greek here, there is only one Greek word here, and the, the, the translators of this version have put two words in to express it. So effective fervent is actually just a word in the Greek which you might recognize as energized. Energized prayer. What, what, what is it energized by? The Spirit of God applying the Word of God. The promises of God. God says, I am going, no, I've got to get my words right. God says, I am building my church. And we look at the state of it, Radio 4 this morning. I hadn't time to listen to all of Sunday, I never do. But it talked about a church in Scotland that was closing after 900 years. And then they made a the little statement at the end. If your church is closing, please write in and tell us. What a miserable state we're in when religious news is about the decline of Christianity. And if you look on the, 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 the broad highway of religion today, you can see that it's in a terrible state. What are you doing about it? At the very least, you should be effectively, passionately calling on God to fulfill his promise. I can't do it, Lord. I've given your word out for 30 odd years here and look at the non-results. And yet your word does say that your word will not return to your void. But it will in fact accomplish that for which you've sent it. Lord, have mercy. You've revealed yourself as the God of mercy. You've revealed yourself as a God who's not willing that any should perish. And look at them, Lord. They're tumbling into hell faster than I can count them. You see, you can't pray about these things and just say, please, Lord, if it's convenient, could you sort that? The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And just in case you haven't understood it, the Bible is then full of examples. You remember Abraham and the three visitors who is just fed after he's been promised he's going to be a dad again? And they're going to Sodom. Does, does, does Abraham just say, on your way? No, he prays and you have that prayer where he begins. What if you find 50 righteous? What if you find 40? What if you find, what an audacity. Why would God... Allow Abraham to pray like that because God has made promises. And he expects us to believe his promises and then invert them into prayer. What about Moses? We read about him last week. If you had read Exodus 32, you would find a parallel account. Twice God said to Moses, stand back. I'm going to wipe them out. And start all over with you. And what does Moses say? You can't do that, Lord. Your reputation is at stake. Your glory is at stake. Can you see how knowing who God is, knowing his promises, is going to 
energize your prayer life. Elijah is mentioned here. The whole world against him. He prophesies a drought and it comes to pass and the king's for his head. His prayer isn't so dramatic and dynamic. Oh Lord, I'm just a poor miserable man. I'm paraphrasing when they and God speaks to him in the cave, isn't it? What are you doing here, Elijah? I think we're too like Elijah. We go into hiding. Instead of coming and standing on the promises of Christ, our King. What about that whole book of Psalms? Oh, there's some beautiful praise in there. But there's some really difficult ones where David is saying, Where are you? What's happening? I had it written down here. First one. Awake. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise. Do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise for our help and redeem us. For your mercy's sake. Psalm 44, verse 23. Can you grab this picture, you see, that God's people are often pushed into a corner so that they will pray, and we are in a corner. And we, you and I, need to know which promises are still ours, and we need to use them. Jeremiah predicted that Israel would go into captivity for 70 years and then in the book of Daniel, you find that Daniel's been reading Jeremiah. And lo and behold, there's the promise. And Daniel takes it to God. Then I set my face towards, toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him, with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. Oh, Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us a shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And all Israel, those near and those far off in the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Do you grab the picture? Daniel saw God's promise and he saw the present circumstances. And he didn't just say, oh, well, that's an end of that. Send in me your report when your church closes. He says, God, you're a covenant keeping God. God has made promises to Jesus that he will have a people who will be his bride at the end of the ages. And some of them are sitting right before me. And I believe we're still here because there's many still around us. They just don't know it yet. And when you begin to grapple with that in prayer, then you'll be asking God, how am I supposed to, to inform them? What's to be done to shake the complacency of this present day and age? There are pictures in the New Testament. The one that came to mind was when the disciples were crossing the sea in the storm. And Jesus was asleep in the stern of the boat. Do you ever get fascinated by that? Why was God asleep in the presence of of these men? Why was he allowing them to struggle? So that they would recognize that they were powerless against what was happening. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And of course he cares. One word from Jesus and the storm is gone and they're at the shore. What would have happened if they had just left him asleep? Can you see that Having God's will done is a real challenge to us. And so I've written here the real test 
in our times of temptation is who do you talk to about it? Do you complain? Grumbling is a serious sin in the Bible because it's destructive. It's, it corrodes. Who do you talk to? God is still here. His power has not changed. His purpose is laid out clearly. Oh, you say, but we're not, that's got nothing to do with it. God has not changed. And if it should be his pleasure for us to wait for another 50 years, that's his pleasure. My place is, you will be done. I've really been encouraged in the last year that we're taking more time to pray as a church. Thursday night, Sunday night. But it has intrigued me that, I, I don't mean to be critical, there's not a lot of passion in it. I wouldn't describe it as effective fervent prayer, would you? We pray because we know it's the right thing to do, and I'm all for that. I'm not criticizing in the least. And then there are some folks who can't make it to our prayer times. Why is there no cry for another prayer time when they can make it? Prayer is essential. God's reputation is at stake in the present day. The leaders of the established church are an embarrassment to us. Is that where it's going? They've announced that the, the, the C of E will cease to exist by 2060, I think it is. I know they're wrong, by the way, but they've announced it, the, the, the people who do those calculations. Are we just going to sit back like Nero and Fiddle while Rome burns? Or are we going to say reverently, Oi, oh, it's wrong, isn't it? You know what I mean? Are we going to say, Reverend, Lord, I can't fix this. You need to, and here am I, I'm available to get that done. Finally, just in the last few minutes, take you to Elijah. I don't think he's here by accident. As somebody pointed out, verse 17, notice, when you see Elijah, you immediately think of that Old Testament giant, but that's not how James is talking. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And maybe that fleeing to the cave ex exemplifies that, doesn't it? It's easy to stand in the pulpit and spout. It's something entirely different to get on your knees and pray. Elijah was not superhuman. Notice again, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly. I saw that word earnestly and thought, is that the same as verse 16? No. What you've actually got in the Greek, it says, praying, he prayed. Praying, he prayed. So he wasn't just at the time of prayer. He was actually making it his business that it would not rain. And it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That's the pattern in the Old Testament. I've got a long list here. People like Noah. Can you imagine building an ark for 100 years, and you've never seen a flood? People like Lot. We're told in the scriptures that for all, he, he, he was in the wrong place. He wasn't indifferent. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day by day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. When was the last time your soul was tormented by what's going on in the present age? Understand there's a principle here to be held on to. That when you pray, you pray in faith. You understand that God has a whole world to manage. And that your prayer, while it's important, needs to be fitted into the jigsaw of time. And that you can absolutely trust God to put it in at the right place at the right time. And then you keep on going back. 
like a persistent child. Again, in the book of Daniel, you get that account in chapter 10 where Gabriel finally comes to answer him and explains that he's been prevented answering Daniel's prayer because the prince of Persia or Satan has been active. There's a lot more going on than you and I can see. If like Elisha's servant, your eyes were open, this room is full. Just because you and I can't see it means absolutely nothing. God is working his timetable. Even the Apostle Paul talks about Satan hindering him. 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. So there's a mystery in prayer, which means that you have to keep on praying and believing and doing what God has called you and I to do. Time's gone. I came across some quotes from Martin Luther, and I'm going to finish with them. Luther repeatedly says that people should pray because God commands it. We do not pray after meeting certain requirements or only at certain times or if we are good enough. The first thing to know is this. It is our duty to pray because of God's command. Since God commands prayer, we can be sure that he will not allow our prayers to be futile or lost. For if he did not intend to answer you, he would not have ordered you to pray and backed it up with such a strict commandment. That's profound, isn't it? If he didn't intend to answer it, he would never have told you to pray. In order to pray rightly with faith, the believer must have a promise from God. We should then reflect on this promise and remind God of it. It's not that God's forgotten. It's about you coming to the place of saying, your will be done. It's more about getting your head into the, 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 the condition where it can be, in fact, the recipient of God's blessing. Faith is so vital to the efficacy of prayer that Luther often emphasizes the importance of saying, Amen. And he goes on to say that it's important for all of us to say amen together because you are never on your own when you pray. You're standing with the whole of Christendom, he says, and with every devout Christian throughout the world. And as you finish your prayer, underline it by saying, let it be. And let the prayers of others be. Do not leave your prayer without having said or thought. Very well, God has heard my prayer. This I know is a certainty in the truth. That is what amen means. Your will be done. Don't let your passion die. May God set it on fire again today and mine. Learn, review God's promises. Get a hold of them. Stir yourself to attend prayer meetings. They're everywhere. Because it's a place that only believers go. You might get an odd unbeliever in a prayer meeting, but it's not really their environment. Believers pray. If anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Oh, that God would revive a spirit of prayer among Christians throughout the land once again. You only need to read the histories of revivals to see that before revival comes, God's people start claiming his promises. Amen. A final hymn that this part is, O Lord my God, I stand and gaze in wonder. 714. Have you been standing and gazing in wonder recently? On the vast heavens your wisdom has ordained. Sun, moon and stars continue at your pleasure. From nothing called and by your power sustained. 714. <coughs> Thank you.
thank you for a heart which cries out in prayer 
and praise. And pray, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased to encourage us in this great work to which we're called. And equip us, Lord, for every day that lies ahead, for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.